Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Today, we're going to cover my chapter 11, your chapter 13, solutions, properties of solutions. And uh, I handed out molecular way to freezing point by freezing point depression. That's our next week's lab. And that one I know is in Brightspace. So uh, you'll have access to that copy, Doug. In fact, I think I've got everything that we've I've handed out so far in Brightspace. Oh, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, you know what it reminds me of? Brightspace is the kind of uh, learning management system I would develop and deploy for third graders. Yeah. Just, I like Blackboard software. It's cleaner. Blackboard yeah. is cleaner. It's easier to get around. Logical. Yeah. All right. I had to uh, reset a test, a quiz for one of my classes. I had to reset it for a student. I don't know where it was. I had to look it up. How do you do that? Okay. So for me, it's a matter of finding out how to do the same things I did in Blackboard. <laughs> I try to keep it really simple so that uh, if you want information like the stuff I hand out in class, go to content and then go to uh, start here. Uh, other things, it's got um, grades. You're probably interested in the grades. Go click that one. And if you see something in that doesn't look right, tell me, because because I'm uh, I'm on a steep learning curve too. Okay, let me turn this light off. Yeah, that's better. All right. So without further ado, let's um, let's get into properties of solutions. Um, last week we looked at. Uh, liquids and solids. And the last part of that, we got into um, unit cells and closest packing models. And I don't know, just looking back on it, I feel like it was just kind of a jumble. I don't know if you felt the same way, but I've never felt comfortable with that topic because it's not very well presented in the general chemistry books. <clears throat> so, as far as that goes, pay attention to the review documents. If, if it's not in the review document, then you probably won't see it ever. on the right ever, or at least on the exam. And next week we will, we are scheduled for a re review session. Yeah, we'll do, yeah, we'll do review session next week and, and hope that the weather cooperates and we can do the lab. And uh, Doug, isn't that when you're supposed to go on your tour, uh, uh, cruise next week? Yep, if you know I'm COVID free by then. So you need to get well. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll see. Hope you're able to get there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let me see. Here's my pointer. Uh, solutions. Solutions. I'm a little more comfortable with. Um. First of all, we know that a solution is a homogeneous mixture. So in other words, it's a physical combination of various um, pure substances. Uh, and it can be, that can be any phase. If you can have combinations of any phases. In fact, some of them you could have three different phases at once. <clears throat> Air is a uh, solution of, of a gas and a gas, actually several gases, nitrogen, oxygen, some argon, and then some trace stuff. Right. Um, booze <laughs> and antifreeze, they're combinations of two liquids. That's normally what we think of as a solution of this type and uh, liquid, let's see, solution. liquid solid, right? sugar water, seawater, 
those are typically what we think of when we think of solutions. But uh, you can have solid, solid brass as a solution, copper and nickel, uh, a gas and a liquid, carbonated water as a solution. And you can even have gases on solids form solutions. Um, the catalytic converter in your car is, um, well, it used to be ceramic beads that were coated with platinum and palladium um, to uh, catalyze the further uh, reaction and uh, take care of the nitrogen oxides and the incomplete combustion products and make uh, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water. Well, the gas uh, that passes through your catalytic converter actually dissolves in the solid as the reaction is taking place. This particular one referenced here, hydrogen in platinum, that is the way that uh, unsaturated fatty acids in uh, fats and oils are converted into saturated fatty acids. And the reason they do that at least for the food industry, is it makes, uh, it increases the melting point and the boiling point. So you can heat them higher and uh, cook your food at higher temperature without the oil degrading. But there are other problems, we won't go into that. <laughs> okay, how do we express solution composition? If you have a mixture of pure substances, and they're uniform, homogeneous mixture, then composition means how much of each one is there in a given uh, volume or mass of that solution. And these are the four main ones. Uh, molarity, uh, mass, percent. Remember, whenever you talk about percent, you gotta specify what's what because percent is a dimensionless number, it just parts per hundred. So if you don't know what goes into it, if you don't know the formula, mass of this per mass of that, then you're kind of lost. Uh, mole fraction, this is also a dimensionless number, but it's dimensionless because the numerator's moles and the denominator's moles, they cancel. So the mole fraction is just that, it's a fraction, something less than one. And then molality is kind of like molarity. We're going to go into these in detail in just a minute. This one, in fact, is the one, uh, if we get here next week, this is the one we're going to use next week, molality. Molarity. <clears throat> okay. Um, molarity is simply stated the moles of solute per liter of solution. Now, you'll also recall that this is an intensive property. In other words, it doesn't matter how much of the solution you have, it's always that value. You take a small amount, a large amount, it's still so many moles per liter. And this is critical. When you express a value for molarity, you are implying that the numerator is in moles, the denominator is in liters. So it's not just uh, moles per unit for, for volume. Okay, what's the advantage of something like this? Well, if you want to uh, know that you have acquired a certain number of moles of a solute and you know the molarity, then you can calculate how much of that solution you need to get that many moles, right? It's like any other formula, right? Um, variable, variable, variable. If you know two of them, you can solve for the third. So if we know this one and that one, we can solve for how many moles. Or if we know uh, this one and that one, we can solve for how many milliliters, or, well, liters um, that you need to give you that many moles. Okay, for instance, if we know we have a mole of sugar and 125 milliliters of solution, what's the concentration? Well, check your units of measure. 
by definition, it has to be liters. So we've got to convert that to that. And then take one mole. So 0.125 into one, which is the reciprocal of it, is eight molar. And that's not unusual. Sugar is extremely soluble. Uh, you can put a lot of sugar in a little bit of water. Okay, how about this one? You have a 10 molar sugar solution. What volume of the solution do you need to possess two moles of sugar? Well, we know this one, that's 10. And we know this one. Right? So we solve for this one. Comes over here, that one goes over here. So we have uh, two divided by 10 is one fifth. 0 0.2 liters is what you need to give you that many moles. <clears throat> okay. Now, here's, the, here's the, the point of this slide is that you can have the same mass of solute. And did we define those terms yet? I just assume solute is the minor component that goes into the solution. And the solvent is the major component. Like in aqueous solution, this would be water and this would be whatever else, sugar, yeah. Okay, so, um, and the solute's in terms of moles. Well, I don't know any balance that'll measure out Moles of anything, right? You can't calibrate them because uh, different substances have different molar masses. So we always um, determine the mass. And then, in order to calculate the molarity, we have to convert the mass into moles. So if you have 100 grams each of sodium hydroxide and potassium chloride, you're going to have a different molarity. Of the solution if it's dissolved in the same uh, volume of solution. So what you have to do is calculate based upon the uh, molar mass of sodium hydroxide, which I think is about 40. So 100 grams, let's see, if you have 100 grams and you want to convert that to moles, dimensional analysis says this, Get rid of the grams, leave you most. So this is going to be in the neighborhood of 40 for sodium hydroxide. 40 divided into 100 is uh, uh, two and a half, I think 2.5 uh, moles. And then we divide by uh, 0.250 liters. Right. And that's why it's 10. Okay. Potassium chloride, though. 100 grams doesn't get you as many moles because potassium is, is a, a big atom. Chlorine's a big atom. So its molar mass is going to be greater than. If the molar mass is greater, divided into 100 makes a smaller value here. And that's why this concentration is less than that, even though you have the same mass. You can tell I'm, I'm rushing. <laughs> we'll get out of here before that before we can yeah yeah the sun goes down what about 5 30. okay mass percent uh in this case the mass of the solute is known in the numerator and the mass of the solution is known in the denominator. So what's the value of this? Well, one of the values is mass and mass. If the temperature changes, it doesn't matter because mass is not gonna change with temperature. Right? So if you know mass percent, it's mass percent at 100 degrees, it's the same mass percent at zero degrees. Uh, the other thing is it's more convenient sometimes to measure mass of things than it is to measure the volumes. So we can measure the mass of the solute and then we can add that 
to a certain amount of solvent until we get, say, uh, 100 grams. And then we know, uh, based upon what value this was, what our percent is. But if we're going for 100 grams here, then 100, the mass percent is equal to the value of the mass of the site because these cancel. <clears throat> and very often, um, an analytical chemist will, will return the values to you in these terms. And by telling you what the mass percent is, plus you know what the components are, then you can, you can figure any of the other versions of uh, composition that you want. Percent by mass, 5.5 grams of glucose in 78.2 grams of water. Okay, here's the catch. Mass percent is based on mass of the solution. So what's the mass of the solution? Five and a half plus 78.2. So you would say 5.5 divided by this plus that times 100. Mole fraction. Mole fraction is just what it says. It's the fraction of moles of the solute in the total moles of a solution. This is valuable where gases are concerned in particular. <coughs> well, and for liquid solutions that have volatile components, we're gonna, we're gonna take advantage of this later in those terms. Um, a solution of phosphoric acid. If we dissolve eight grams in 100 milliliters of water, what's the mole fraction? Well, you need to know the moles of water. You need the moles of salt, uh, phosphoric acid. And then the total moles is the moles of this plus the moles of that in the denominator. And then the mole fraction of this in the numerator is the moles of that. And it's always going to be a fraction. It's going to be less than one. Right? Because if it's one, what does that mean? That means there's nothing else in there but that, right? <laughs> yeah. So this is the mole fraction based on that information. And in this case, we needed to know uh, with that many milliliters of water, we needed to know what's the mass of water before you can calculate the moles of water. Because you can't calculate the moles from volume. You need grams. So we used we calculated the grams, which in this case is 100 grams of water. And then we divide by 18.02 and get the moles of water. And this one, you have to calculate the uh, molar mass of uh, phosphoric acid to finish it off. But eventually you end up with this mole fraction. Right? So it's um, between uh, 100 and 200. Mole fraction. It's pretty dilute. Molality. Okay, molality, uh, think back to molarity with a big M. A little m means, uh, in terms of solution composition, the moles of the solute is the same. But instead of uh, liters of solution, we're basing it upon mass, kilograms of solvent. So we changed two things. We changed the, from volume to mass, and we changed from solution to solvent. So why do we need to use molality? For a similar reason that the advantage of uh, mo um, mass percent, this is impervious to the change of temperature. And our uh, experiment next week will be molar mass by freezing point depression. So one of the parameters of that experiment is a change in temperature. If we're going to change the temperature, we want a value that is impervious to that change. And that's why we use molality. Okay. So molality of this same solution we looked at before is 0.816. Let's see, what was it before we calculated? 
not a mole fraction. Okay, so they're different values. Okay, so when we form a um, uh, a liquid solution, we can uh, intellectually subdivide the steps. Now, when a solution forms, all of these are happening at the same time. Um, or, or if there if there actually are steps in the formation of the solution, there are only microseconds between. So we separate them out to help us understand what's happening in the formation of the solution. Uh, first step, you have to take solute and separate the individual uh, atoms or molecules from their neighbors. Right? If there are intermolecular forces holding them together or attracting them in any other way, you've got to add enough energy to pull them apart. You've got to disrupt that energy that's holding the solute together. That's an uh, endothermic process. You have to add energy to it. Also, in the solute <coughs> solvent, you got to make a hole. You got to pull the solvent molecules apart to make space for the solute. This is also endothermic. Okay. Then when you form the association between the solute and the solvent, you get some of that energy back. This is exothermic. Now, those are individual steps. The overall energy of formation for the solution could be endothermic or exothermic, right? Um, uh, any of those cold packs or hot packs that hospitals use uh, will testify to the fact that Overall, it could be generate heat or it could generate cold. And the key is the difference between the input and what you get back. So if you get back a lot more energy than you put in, it's going to be exothermic. But if you have to put a whole lot of energy in and you don't get much back, it's endothermic. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so expressed in terms of uh, enthalpies, this is where you break the solute apart, this is where you break the solvent apart, make a hole, and this is where you get energy back. And then when you add them together with our sign conventions, right, this would be plus, plus, minus. And the magnitude of those values determines the sign on this one. Okay, uh, let's see, that's repetition. Uh, this is sort of repetition. It's a bigger equation. It's same thing though. Backwards. <clears throat> yeah, it's backwards, right. And this is a graphical representation. You put energy in to get this part and then you get some energy back. In this case, you get a lot of energy back. That's negative, so it's exothermic. And this one would be uh, here, positive, so it's uh, endothermic. Um, question, why does water and oil not mix? Well, um, this is a graph that came out of my textbook and yours probably has one similar. And it, it speaks to the uh, solubility and the heat of solution for uh, polar solutes, polar nonpolars solutes and polar nonpolar solvents. So what we're saying is in this, where we have a polar solute and a polar solvent, then it takes a lot of energy to bust the solute apart. It takes a lot of energy to make a hole, but you get a lot of energy back. So the difference is relatively small and a solution forms. Um, uh, polar solute water and nonpolar sol, no, uh, this nonpolar solute is oil. 
and the polar solvent's water. So it takes just a tiny amount of energy to break that oil apart. It takes a lot of energy to break the water apart, and they don't like each other because one's polar and one's non-polar, so you don't get much back. There's a large difference here, and you don't get a solution. So the moral of this story is, uh, overall, if you get a large value here, then you don't get a solution. Is it forest water and oil mix? I'm sorry? Forest water and oil mix? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, high temperature. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you know anybody that's got a uh, steam cleaning machine, um, maybe an auto shop, they'll, they'll clean engines with, with a steam one. Uh, that's when you can get uh, oil to dissolve in water with very high temperature. Um, I don't know, because it's kind of hard to see what's going on in that steam cloud. Um, but once the steam evaporates, then you still got your puddle of oil. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So in general, um, one factor that favors uh, the process of solution formation is an increase in the probability of the state when the solute and solvent are mixed. And that's, that's sort of like um, uh, entropy. Increase the probability. So what's the probability uh, with entropy? Uh, the more microstates you have available, the more likely it is to move that direction. And I think that's what they're getting at here. Process that requires a large amount of energy tend not to occur. So when we say that delta H is a large positive, large input of energy, it's not going to occur. And then there's always the rule of thumb. Like dissolves like. So polar dissolve polar, non-polar dissolve non-polar, and never the twenty shall meet. Okay, factors affecting solubility. We mentioned polarity already. Uh, then there are effects of pressure that can be taken into account. And these are, I would say exclusively related to gas dissolving in a liquid because liquids and solids don't respond to pressure. So that's, that's Henry's law that uh, quantifies the effect of pressure on solubility of a gas. And then there are temperature effects. And these can, these can be uh, quantified. Well, they can't actually be quantified that easily. They can be, but it's more of a, like an engineering chart, tables rather than a formula. But there are temperature effects that change uh, how soluble the solute is in the solvent. And it's very difficult to predict. Uh, there are structural effects. And these largely relate to um, the polarity of the molecules. Remember when we said, how do you determine the polarity of molecule? First you need know whether the bonds are polar, and then you need to know uh, if they are polar, you need to know the geometry. And if the, um, uh, for nonpolar substances, they're, they're often called water fear and hydrophobic. Yeah. And hydrophilic is the other way around. They, they love water. Okay, Henry's law. <clears throat> if you want to know the concentration of a gas dissolved in a liquid, first of, the, first of all, you need um, to know the partial pressure of the gas in the headspace above the solution. Now, that's because you could have mixtures of gases. So you need to know the partial pressure of the individual gas investigated. Um, so with air, you'd, uh, largely you just need to know the partial pressure of nitrogen and the partial pressure of oxygen. And if you increase the pressure on both of them, then they'll respond equally. Um, then you need to know what's this proportionality constant because that will vary uh, depending on the gas and the solvent. 
Um, but we can say that the amount of gas that's dissolved in the solution is directly proportional to the pressure. Pressure goes up, concentration goes up. And this is an artist rendition. If you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure, you drive more of the uh, molecules into solution. And this is a direct result of the uh, kinetic molecular theory of gases. We, we covered that last time, didn't we? Yeah. Um, notice that what's happened is uh, you've got the same kinetic energy for individual molecules, but you've got more of them impinging on the surface because you've uh, decreased their space. Mm -hmm. So now you're going to get more of them. Uh, and you can look at this in terms of Le Chatelier too, because if you increase the pressure, how is that system going to respond? It's going to try to decrease the pressure by putting more of these gases into solution where they don't uh, exert pressure on the piston. Temperature effects. Okay. Um, most solids, most solid solutes become more soluble as the temperature increases. But there are exceptions. In some cases, the solubility decreases as you increase the temperature. Um, and like I said before, it's very difficult to predict. Solubility of gases, though, in general, uh, become less soluble as you increase the temperature. Think about it. As you increase the temperature of your solution, everything increases kinetic energy. So if a gas is in the solution and it's at the surface, has more kinetic energy, it's going to leave the surface with uh, more frequency. So we increase the temperature, we decrease the solubility of gases. And here we have, uh, these are solids dissolved in water with temperature, right? So the solubility in grams per 100 grams of water, right? There's our uh, mass percent right there. Uh, increases for sugar, okay? increases for potassium nitrate, increases for sodium nitrate, barely increases for sodium bromide, but there's a slight increase. Potassium bromide increases, potassium chloride increases, sodium sulfate decreases, and cesium, so cesium, uh, cerium, cerium sulfate decreases. How much sugar would you mix with the water to make it be sugar? Say that again. Like, if you put enough sugar in the water, could you just make a sugar steel? I went to the solid. Oh, um, you would still have some water in there. Yeah. Um, you could reach saturation eventually. Yeah, it takes a lot. It takes a very large amount. In fact, um, there are many industries that use uh, sucrose as one of their feedstocks. Oh, yeah. And they, they, uh, some of them find that it's cheaper and more efficient to move that sugar as a liquid. Right? I've got a book at home, a blue book called "This Is Liquid Sugar," and it's um, uh, it's actually more efficient to move the liquid because once you get there in your tanker, you can transport it more easily. And as long as the process that it's undergoing. Uh, doesn't matter that it's got a little water in it, uh, then that's an efficient way to move it. But uh, the advantage, uh, to take off from what you said, the advantage is that uh, that liquid has very little water in it. So there's in water, it would be considered waste because it's not part of the process. <clears throat> um, but you can saturate it, right? That's where they get rock, uh, rock sugar, rock candy. They saturate the solution and then they decrease the temperature and they have a, a, a string with a seed on it and it forms gradually around the end, makes like a nice big sugar crystal. That's your rock candy. Years since I even saw one of those. Yeah, not too common anymore, are they? I was like eight, first time and last time I had one. It was like <laughs> in Tennessee when I had it too, so I can't really remember it. Oh, maybe they don't have them in this state. 
They did, I think, because I think Mom tried to get me to have one really long time ago. But it was like, it was like in certain stories, I think. Uh huh. Like old time stories, <laughs> mostly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of still have uh, boiled wood floors, the pickle barrels. Yeah, I remember those growing up. Okay, here's gas solubility in water. Uh, methane decreases with temperature. Oxygen, carbon monoxide, nitrogen decreases with temperature. The nice thing about helium is it's, it's very insoluble at any temperature, right? Um, in fact, we used to use helium in uh, one of in our uh, liquid chromatograph because the, the mobile phase, the solution that we drive through the column under very high pressure, uh, once it reaches the other end, if there's any dissolved gas, when that pressure's off, the gas comes spurting out and, and plays havoc with your detector. So there are two ways to deal with that. Your uh, solvent, the uh, mobile phase that you're driving through there, you can pull a vacuum on it and the, uh, the gases will come out of solution. Um, but you can also bubble helium through it. And helium is so insoluble, it displaces all these other gases, but it doesn't leave much of itself behind. And that's what we used, and it worked really well. Um, what if we, if we have a, a solution over here, and we have pure water here, right, in a bell jar? So they share an atmosphere, but they're separated the solutions. This solution is separated from pure water. So at all times, you're um, and. And this blue dot is an insoluble solute. In other words, it has no vapor pressure. So what's happening? Well, the vapor pressure of water from this one is lower than it is for that one of Henry, because of Henry's law. So you're building up water vapor here, but it's, it's, in, it's the same concentration above both of them so it's going back and forth here at a certain rate, but over here, it's going back at a faster rate. So eventually, um, equilibrium is established when uh, all of this is gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen that done. It's, it's fascinating. Um, in fact, the, the best way to do it is with a concentrated solution of sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is extremely hydroscopic. Um, so uh, it, it worked really great. Okay. Now here's a, an expression of vapor pressure above a solution. Rather, see, Henry's law talked about the concentration of the gas in solution and related that to pressure. In this case, we relate the, the actual pressure of the uh, liquid in the gas phase, as it leaves the liquid and goes into the gas phase, we can um, uh, relate that actual pressure above the solution to the mole fraction of the solvent. So if this is the uh, vapor pressure of the pure solvent, and we put a non-volatile solute in there, that decreases the pressure based upon the mole fraction of the solvent after you add the solute. Now, this formula works for uh, a non-volatile solute because the solute has no vapor pressure of its own. But if we put a solute in there that has a volatility of its own, then you have to modify that equation. Right? In that case, you would say um, this is for one component, right? And this would be for uh, this is mole fraction of one, this is the mole fraction of two, and it's uh, pure vapor pressure. And you can add those two together, and that'll give you the final solution. That's somewhat like that other model that we had last semester. 
come up slash deployer slash volume two. And volume means pressure. Or volume two pressure two. Oh, oh, uh, Dawson's law of partial pressures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Similar. Um, so if we talk about the mole fraction, uh, and, and this is the case where you have a non volatile solvent, uh, solute, excuse me, then the mole fraction of the solvent, uh, it, the increase the pressure from the zero solvent, obviously. And as you, as you get more, a higher mole fraction of the solvent, you increase its vapor pressure until it's pure. And then there's your pure solvent pressure. Uh, if we have, now that's Rayleigh's law. Here we have uh, the expression that I showed you earlier. This is a two component. This could be, you could do three, four, five, six components. Right, and get a total pressure. The modified Rayleigh's law looks like this. This is one component, right, until it's pure. And this is the other component going the other way until it's pure. So it goes backwards. This is the pure B, this is the pure A. And the vapor pressure should be a connecting line between pure A and pure B. Here. That's if the, uh, this is for an ideal solution. And an ideal solution we mean as these components don't interact with each other, negatively or positively. Right? If they um, if they repel one another in some form or fashion, then what you will do is, as you uh, increase one, you will increase its vapor pressure and decrease the other one, and you add them together, you will get. Um, If they repel one another, if there's a weak interaction between solute and solid, then you will get this uh, convex deviation. If there's a strong interaction between the solute and the solvent, then you'll get this concave interaction. So that's an investigative tool that you can use to just to see how. Uh, the the two solutes interact. Okay, um, let's see. If the interactive forces over here are listed as um, A interacts with with itself and B interacts with itself, and they're essentially equal to one another when A and B interact, we have the same type of interaction strength of interaction is equal, then you're going to get an ideal. The delta H for the solution is virtually zero. The change in temperature when the solution forms is zero. And the deviation from Rayleigh's law is nothing. It's ideal. And here's an example. Benzene and toluene. Benzene is that ring structure. An aromatic ring, and then toluene is like that, only it's got a methyl group on it. Um, so, if the interaction between uh, one component and the other component is such that these interactions are less, the A and B really attract one another, then you're going to get that negative deviation. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Yes, I was right. <laughs> Negative deviation. And acetone and water are examples of that. Acetone and water love each other. Yeah. And then the other way around, if they, if they repel one another, right here, these interactions are greater than those, then you get a positive deviation that flow this way. And ethanol and hexane are like that. Uh, a certain amount of ethanol will dissolve in hexane, right? This is slightly polar and this is nonpolar, but they will dissolve in one another to a certain degree. And when they do, um, you get that uh, positive deviation because they don't like one another, in other words. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is true. Yeah, and that drives them out of solutions. I don't want to be in your neighborhood. I'm going in. I'm going up there. Okay. Um, all right. Which one of these would we expect to be a positive, negative, or ideal? Okay. Let's see. I would say ideal would be hexane and octane. Right. They're both hydrocarbons, very similar in, in size. So they would be ideal. Which ones have strong interaction? Strong interaction, I would say, would be ethyl alcohol and water. So they would be a negative deviation. That means this one would probably be positive deviation. Oops. Oh, it's not going to tell me. You have to take my word for it. Okay. What's a colligative property? A colligative property uh, of a solution is one in which the identity of the solute doesn't matter. Only the concentration matters. So we're going to take advantage of that one. And uh, freezing point depression. The, one of the advantages of collegiate properties is if you want to determine the molar mass of something, you don't need to know what the molecule is. You just need to know the colligative relationship that's involved. And you can use that information to calculate the molar mass without even knowing what it is. Um, boiling point elevation, what that means is as you increase the amount of solute in the solution, it increases the boiling point of that solution over the pure solvent. So that's why we put antifreeze. One of the reasons we put antifreeze in our radiators, because with that extra solvent in there, we increase the boiling point. If you just use water, and I think early combustion engines use pure water and they blew their top. Or you have, let's see, what's that? Uh, Risco Darlin on Andy Griffith's show. Have you seen that episode? The first time they meet. Briscoe Darlin's got his, his boys up in the back and his daughter in the front seat. And he's stopped at the uh, memorial uh, horse trough, dipping his hat in there and filling his radiator with water. Right. Um, freezing point depression, right? If you have that same concentration as the boiling point elevation uh, scenario for your engine, it will also decrease the freezing point. So in winter, uh, you're, uh, you won't blow out your freeze plug on the engine block, which is why it's there. So if, if you, the concentration of your antifreeze gets too low and the temperature drops really low, then it might freeze, in which case it'll expand and, it, and blow out that plug at the side rather than crack the block. Another uh, colligative property is osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is an expression of, uh, well, I need to explain it. I, I, need, I need a picture to tell you osmotic pressure. And then vapor pressure we already talked about. How is gas not free? Huh? How is gas not free? Gas, gasoline? Yeah. Gasoline not free. Well, um, it's a nonpolar basically octane has eight carbons and uh, let's see 18 hydrogens it's a non-polar compound which means it doesn't have a strong attraction with its neighbors right? and in order to freeze as you lower the temperature you've got to have a strong enough traction between neighbors to turn liquid so since it's a weak attraction it has to get very low in temperature. Points to be real. Really low, yeah. I've been wondering that lately because it's been getting really cold this winter. And I was like, how's it not freezing? I feel like below zero. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, you're at more risk of at least gelling your fuel if it's diesel. Oh. Because diesel is like uh, C12. 
H26. It's actually a combination, but that's kind of in the middle. Uh, and the, the larger the molecule, as hard as hydrocarbon, the higher the boiling point and the higher the freezing point. So it doesn't have to get as cold to make it solidify. So they probably put additives in to keep it from doing that. Um, okay, so boiling point elevation. Here's the mathematical expression. What we're looking for is what is the difference in temperature between the pure substance boiling point and the solution boiling point. That's what delta T is. So boiling point elevation would be uh, a difference between, this is uh, the solution and this is the pure. So there's a difference there, that temperature, that difference is equal to some constant, A sub B, times the molality of the solvent, the molality of what you dissolve in the solvent. And this is going to be different for each solvent, but it doesn't matter how much solute you have or what the solute is. Okay, so if you know that if you can measure the difference in temperature between the pure stuff and the solution, and then you know this value, you can calculate what is its molal concentration. Uh, okay, so freezing point depression is similar to that. Only now we have a different K value for the solvent. And I think we're using uh, uh, Benzoic acid is our solute here, and our solvent is um, it's one of the fatty acids. Uh, I can't remember what it is. <clears throat> I'd have to cheat and look at the method. But the value here is particular for the solvent. And then we can tell the concentration of benzoic acid in that based upon the difference in temperature. Now the difference in temperature here, it's supposed to be a decrease in temperature, but we throw the sign out because all we care about is that difference. So that's kind of a, a, a point, a problem point. It's gonna be a positive value even if, even though it's a, decrease in the freezing temperature. We just need to know the difference. By the way, if your thermometer is, uh, is reading low by a couple of degrees, it won't have any impact on this value because it's gonna read low at one temperature, then we make the solution, it reads low at the same. So the difference is gonna be the same. So that's an advantage for, for using uh, student thermometers. <laughs> okay, this is an attempt to explain what's happening. So this is a, a diagram for water. And actually, this ought to be tilted back a little more, but that's neither here nor there. This is the vapor pressure for pure water. And this is, uh, see, this is, um, Solid liquid gas in this diagram. Remember that from our phase diagrams. Solid liquid gas. And this is the, the phase line between liquid and gas. And this is the phase line between liquid and solid. And this is the phase line between solid and gas. Okay. So if this is a vapor pressure for pure water, then when we add a solute in there, it shifts the vapor pressure curve to the right and down. And it also shifts, actually it shifts, it, it shrinks, looks like this one moves over, this one moves over, this one moves up. So this is where we tell the difference between boiling point, these two, because there's one atmosphere, right? 
That's boiling point. And then this one is the freezing point between these two molecules. Okay. Um, What's the boiling point of the resulting solution in degrees Celsius for this one? Solution was prepared from 25 grams of glucose to 200 grams of water. The molar mass of glucose is this. Okay. So from molality, we need to know moles of sucrose and uh, mass of water. So the mass of water is going to be 2.2 kilograms. It's moles per kilogram. So that was easy. This one we need to convert to moles, right? We use that one, divide this into that, and then ratio this one to that one. And that will give us the, uh, that will give us the delta T. Right? And this increases the boiling point. So we're gonna take the boiling point of water, 100 degrees, and add that delta T from this calculation. And it only increased the, with that solution, it only increased the boiling point by a third of a degree. Okay. Um, what's the Van Hoff factor? Well, Van Hoff was a chemist. He was a physicist too. He said, if these collective properties are dependent upon the molal concentration or even the molar concentration, because osmotic pressure is in terms of molarity, but the freezing point and boiling point uh, formulas are based on molal, they're based on the moles of the solute. Well, what happens if you put your solute in solution and it busts apart, right? Now you have, when you had one, now you've got two. So things like sodium chloride, when you put those in solution, they go in as one mole and they break apart into two moles. He says the important, um, the importance of the solute is in terms of moles of particles in solution. So he introduced this factor, this I factor, um, which for our purposes roughly is, if the solute breaks apart into two, then I is equal to two. If it breaks into three, I is equal to three. So uh, sodium chloride would be an I of two. Um, Calcium chloride would be a three. Okay. Um, let's see. Sodium phosphate would be a four. So that Van Hoff factor is a correction factor and it's incorporated into, um, let's see. Um, Right. If it's boiling point, well, be here. I mean, if it's if it's a freezing point, we have math there. So we would introduce the correction factor just like that. Now <clears throat> that's under ideal circumstances, right? But what we discover when we actually measure these things and, and calculate back to say what is I. For that solute in this solvent, it usually turns out to be uh, less than that value. So what's going on? Well, what happens is some of those ions pair up again, like this, and that reduces the uh, the splitting effect of a soluble solute. So in in reality, it should be something less than two. I think in, in the case of sodium chloride, it's probably very close to two, it's like 1.95 or something like that. But some of them are 
maybe this one would be something less than four, like 3.6 or seven. <laughs> and, but it's all due to that ion pairing. So we think we got it figured out, and then there's a fly in the oil. Okay, uh, let's see. Examples, I already gave you those examples. Ion pairing. Uh, as the solution becomes more dilute, the ions are farther apart and less pairing occurs. So the pairing is also dependent on concentration. The higher the concentration, the more likely are you, you are to get pairing. So the, um, the Van Hoff factor in reality changes with concentration. Right? As if we didn't have enough trouble as it was. Um, but if the solution is dilute, you can basically say the Van Hoff factor is, is this value. And in fact, for very dilute solutions, uh, you can, the theoretical value is the true value. And it's more important for a very highly charged ions. Now, that comes in, in two factors are involved in, in the charge of an ion, right? One is the actual charge, right? Plus, plus or minus. And the other is the size of the ion. For big ions, the charge is spread over a larger area, so that decreases the intrinsic charge. But for small ions with the same charge, it increases their charge, and they're more likely to pair. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see. Well, it's just a modified equation with the Van Hoff factor. Okay, uh, let's see. Ooh, this, one's, this one takes some doing. Now we've got a combination solution. 20 grams of sucrose and sodium chloride. We don't know what the mixture is. Uh, we just know that it's 20 grams of both of them together are dissolved in one liter of water. The freezing point of the solution is found to be uh, minus 0.426. So it's a freezing point depression of almost a half a degree. If we assume ideal behavior, what's the mass percent composition in the original mixture up here? This one right here, before you put it in solution. And the mole fraction. All right, so let's see. Did I, I hope I did this one on, on the slides. Come on, there we go. Uh, skip one thing. Okay, total mass of the mixture we know is this. These are given, this is given information. Freezing point is that. So the delta freezing point is 0.426. Uh, we have to use a little algebra where we, where we pick an unknown. So if we let the unknown sucrose be X, then the mass of sodium chloride will be. 20 minus x. Okay. So here's the, the number of moles of sucrose will be this divided by the mass, uh, molar mass of sucrose. Mass of sodium chloride is 20 minus x divided by its molar mass. Okay. Now that we know those values, the molality of the solution is going to be this many moles of one plus this many moles of the other divided by a kilogram of the solvent. So far, so good. Um, so now we set uh, the factor for sucrose is one and the factor for sodium chloride is two. So the Kf for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. That's that K value. I know we haven't introduced any of those yet, but there'll be a, a separate one for it's going to bug me until I figure it out. Lauric acid. So we'll have a value for lauric acid here of 3.9 degrees C per mole out. Um, 
Oh, no, we said that. Yeah, you left here. You've probably even moved. She texted me at one before one thirty, asking if I'm left here. Yeah, it was one thirty minutes in the past. Uh, yeah, I got maybe a dozen. I can move through pretty quick though. You don't have to hurry up to be done, or it's gonna be fine. <clears throat> Okay, so let's finish working this problem. Um, here's our constant value. And here's the change in temperature, right? So we know that, 0.426. Now, if we plug this into our formula, we have, this is our change in temperature. There's our Van Hoff factor. There's the molality and there's the K value. Well, this is gonna, this, factor plus molality is this value. Right? We don't know what the Van Hoff combined Van Hoff factor is, but we do know that this relationship is uh, okay. Here's the jump. This is the Van Hoff factor over here for one of these. And this is the Van Hoff factor for sodium chloride. And this is the molality of each one. So this is not explained, but what basically the, uh, uh, the method here is saying that these can be separated into two units and you just add them together to find this value. So this value is uh, Van Hoff factor times molality. And that's what we're saying here. Add them together and you should get this. Okay. So this is the real trick for this one is knowing that you can separate them out of that term. Okay, then all we have to do is solve for X. Okay. And X turns out to be 14.55 grams. That means sodium chloride is 5.45. And then we can calculate the mass percent that's simple enough. And the mole fraction, we just do the moles of sucrose uh, per moles of solution is this one, 0 0.3131. And it didn't ask us for the mole fraction of, uh, of uh, sodium chloride, but you can do the same thing for sodium chloride. Um, <clears throat> All right, um, a plant cell has a natural concentration of 0.25 molal. If you immerse it in an aqueous solution with a freezing point of 0.246, will the cell explode, shrivel, or do nothing? Okay, if the concentration outside the cell is the same as inside the cell, nothing happens. If the concentration outside the cell is higher than it is inside the cell, that means there's less water outside. Water moves out of the cell, and it shrivels. Uh, and that if the concentration inside is greater than, the concentration of solute is greater inside the cell, then water will move in and explode. If the concentration outside is higher uh, of the solute, outside, then the water will move out of the cell. Yeah, yeah. they call it crenellation. Okay. Yeah, that's true, yep. Okay, we know those values. Now, what we have to do is find out what the concentration is outside the cell. And we use the standard freezing point formula to find out what the molality is outside the cell find out it's less outside the cell. So solid, the water is going to move into the cell and it should explode. Right. Move into the cell and it'll explode. Okay, osmotic pressure. All right, osmotic pressure comes with a different formula, but it's still colligative. It only depends on the concentration of the solute. And in this case, 
um, since the calculation incorporates temperature in the uh, formula, we can use a temperature sensitive concentration here. So we use molarity for this one. And this is the Greek letter pi, the capital pi. I was thinking it looks like pi over here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the it's the font. So the osmotic pressure is equal to the molality, uh, excuse me, the molarity of the uh, solute times this uh, gas constant, right? And times temperature, and temperature has to be in Kelvin. Okay, so what is osmotic pressure? Well, you've probably gotten this in anatomy already, haven't you? Yeah. Um, it's an expression of uh, the pressure that builds up across a semi-permeable membrane uh, between two solutions. And if the solute concentration is less outside and greater inside, then the movement of solvent across that membrane will be into the higher concentration. Um, now there's a difference between semi-permeable and selectively permeable. Semi-permeable means that only water moves and gases. We're concerned with water. Selectively permeable is based upon size. And it can be it can be tailored to different size molecules. So you can move water across and you can move molecules up to a certain size and then it blocks the rest. This is the kind of membrane that's used in dialysis. And it's not actually it's not only based on size, it's also based upon charge. Because in, in dialysis, uh, you're, you're tailoring the membrane to reestablish electrolyte balance in the blood too, not just to remove the waste products like uh, urea. Okay, now the pressure that's built up in, inside here is a measure of that osmotic pressure. And at some point, the difference in the height from uh, this level of, of uh, external solution and the pressure that's built up here is sufficient. The reverse pressure here is high enough so that it, it stops the movement, right? it balances the movement. That's where you get a difference in, in uh, that's where you measure the osmotic pressure. So the difference in concentration, if it's higher, then you get a higher pressure here. Okay, this is another way to express it. Um, water will cross the membrane, right? And it's gonna preferentially go this way, right? Because this is the concentration of the solution. And eventually you reach a place where the difference in the height between these two is the osmotic pressure. Now that's when you, we just let it proceed the way it wants to. <clears throat> what we do in reverse osmosis is we apply an external pressure here, and that drives water back through there. And that's the way that you can purify brine or salt water to make potable water. Yep. In fact, we used to use a system like that uh, at the lab I worked at in uh, Beckley for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We had a, a reverse osmosis set up in one part of the building and they piped that water to every lab. And then we took that water and run it through our uh, ion exchange filters to bring it up to extremely pure. Okay, so uh, the Van Hoff correction is also valid for this equation too. Uh, all right, so if we're gonna calculate the molar mass 
of a compound, regardless of how we get there, the molar mass, right? Remember, I abbreviated MW for molecular weight, is mass per mole. Okay, so we got to find a way to get the mass and the moles, right? Mass is usually pretty easy. Just put it on a balance. Moles is, is the tricky part. <laughs> and in this case, uh, we've got this many milligrams of the compound that we don't know what it is. Dissolved in this many milliliters of water, the solution has an osmotic pressure of 558 torr. Calculate the molar mass of this compound. Okay. So um, here's our universal gas constant. In this case, uh, energy is not involved, so we use the one where we have liter atmospheres. And um, uh, because this is atmospheres, then this osmotic pressure has to be in atmospheres also. So we take the tor and convert it to atmospheres. And then we have the molarity here, we have the gas constant there, we have the K temperature here. We find that the molarity is 3.164 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter. Okay. We're almost there. We, at least we got the mole term in here. Now we need to get that mole term out. Right? So we know that the, the uh, molarity times volume is equal to moles, right? based on this definition, uh, moles per unit volume. So we just say moles is equal to molarity times volume. So what's the volume? Well, the volume was uh, 10 milliliters or 0.01 liters. Now we know the moles. So we know the mass, we know the moles, we got our answer. All right, I like this one. That's a sequoia. Sequoia, I don't know if it's gigantic or sempervirens. Those are the first person standard. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, um, we know that if you if you put a, a tube, a long tube in water, and you pull a vacuum on it, how high will the water go? At one atmosphere pressure at the surface of the earth, it'll only go 33 feet. That's it, it won't go any higher. So that's like here. How do you get water all the way to the top where it's needed? Right? Uh, at one time, I mistakenly thought that there was a suction applied by the leaves. Right? As they evaporate, they create a suction. And that may be part of it. But I found a better uh, explanation. Osmotic pressure in the roots. OK? The water's going up, yep. Osmotic pressure in roots has been measured at 20 atmospheres for tall trees. Very high pressure. How does it get that pressure? Well, it gets that pressure because the concentration of solute in the root cells is higher than it is in the groundwater outside. So the water moves into the cells with enormous pressure. Now, is that enough to reach 300 feet tall? I do the calculation, right? 300 feet is this many millimeters. That has to travel. Okay. So the next question is what is 20 atmospheres in terms of millimeters of water? So this is millimeters of mercury. Then we use the ratio of the density of water to the density of mercury and find that um, there is sufficient pressure to push that water up to two times 10 to the fifth millimeters, which is exceeds the height of the tree. So there's plenty of pressure there to get it that high. <clears throat> the trick is for the tree to have a hydraulic system that will stand up to that pressure. And it does. You know, it's crazy how the sand the tree is a little like free and suddenly the tree is pulling over. I've heard of that, but I've never seen it. I ain't never seen it, but I've heard it happen. Uh -huh. It was near my house all of a sudden. You hear a tree fall over. I said, well, that froze. <laughs> Yeah. Should be sitting on the porch on the end truck with a buffer sapper. Normally, what trees try to do is move that sap into their roots where it won't freeze. 
tell those are either too fast apparently. <laughs> yeah. And, and, right. The temperature could have dropped too fast at the wrong season of the year. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, colloid. We're getting close. What's a colloid? Well, up to this point, we've been talking about solutions. A colloid can be mistaken for a solution because the um, suspended particles are evenly distributed in the mixture, but they're not a true solution. Um, these particles are suspended based upon their particle size. They're small enough so that the random motion of the suspending medium can keep them separated in, in, in suspension. Now, what are, what's the colloid? Well, example of a colloid, um, jello. Oh, uh, like a, a made of gelatin. Mm-hmm. Gelatin's a couple. Instead of going all the way to different. Yeah. Now, how do you tell the difference between a solution and a colloid? There's a neat trick. It's called the Tyndall effect. And it's based upon light scattering. If those particles are actually solids in solution, then they will behave along with the solvent to let light pass through them all the way through and you will not see. So let's say uh, we have this container of something, colloid solution, we don't know what it is. And say we have a light on this side, like shine a light here. And then you have your, you have, uh, your eyeball on this side. You obviously will see light coming out that side. I mean, unless it's opaque, you're assuming not. But if it's a solution, if you look at it from the side, you see nothing. That's a solution. But if you see something from the side, that's a colloid. Yeah, because, a stuff. right, the particles are uh, diffusing the light. We use that in, in the lab in one of our experiments. Let me see. Are we going to do that one this year? I hope so. It's neat. Yep. Formation constant of a complex ion. Are we going to make that? No. <laughs> but we're going to precipitate. Uh, we're going to do a titration, and the endpoint is the uh, formation of pure silver uh, suspended. So we're going to use the Tyndall effect to find the exact endpoint of that, right? Uh, it's so finely divided, if you just use ambient light, uh, you're gonna miss the endpoint. So we dim the lights and we use the Tyndall effect to see when that uh, silver colloid forms. Okay. Um, so here are different types of colloids. You get a similar thing to solutions. Right. You get mixtures of gases and liquids and solids, um, and they have different names. Right? Uh, a fog or an aerosol spray is a liquid in a gas. The liquid is the dispersed substance and the dispersing medium. The gas, that's an aerosol. Yeah, because the gas is forcing the liquid out. An aerosol can. Oh, oh, okay, I see. When you do spray the can, you get... Um, finely divided particles of liquid in the air, right? That's an aerosol. Uh, you can also, a smoke is also an aerosol. It's a solid in a gas. Um, whipped cream or soap suds, that's a gas in liquid. It's also called a foam. Uh, liquid in a liquid, mayonnaise and milk, emulsion, how do we keep um, fats in milk suspended? It's a process called homogenation. Uh, mm -hmm. You take the milk and you drive it under high pressure through a sieve with small holes in it, and it busts up the fast particles into very small. So they won't coalesce and uh, collect as cream on the surface. We're talking about milk. 
Um, let's see, paints, clays, gelatin. Okay, so there's your gelatin. Uh, is a uh, solid in a liquid. It's called a sol. Marshmallows, star, uh, polystyrene foam, is a gas in a solid. That's a solid foam. This is a, a gas in a liquid. It's a foam. Solid foam is a gas in a solid. Um, this is also <coughs> those uh, ceramic bricks that they put on the space shuttle. Those were, that was a solid foam because they're very, very light. And you can heat it up to red hot and grab it by the corners. They're going to be hot. <laughs> yeah. Because there's not much heat there. It might be high temperature, but there's no heat. Uh, let's see, butter and cheese. That's a liquid and a solid. Solid emulsion. And ruby. Uh, it's a solid and a solid. Solid salt. Okay, what do we mean by coagulation? It's particular to colloids. If you destroy the colloid, which means whatever was suspended now will not be suspended. It drops out of, of uh, suspension. Are there blood colloids? Yes. So if, you're, if your blood is not handled properly, you can coagulate, right? And then it's no good. Or if you want it to coagulate, then it leaves behind plasma. Yeah. Usually accomplished either by heating or by adding an electrolyte. So you can you can salt out the colloid or you can destroy it by heating. And if proteins are involved, usually what happens is the three-dimensional structure of the protein is destroyed by heating or by salting. That's the way we used to do it in the lab anyway. Oh, that's it.